stand and go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, it is a privilege and an honor. God, we worship you tonight, Jesus. Lord, we give you all the honor, all the glory, Father. Heavenly King, have your way, Jesus. Lord, it is our honor and our privilege, Lord Jesus, to just lift you up and just to tell you, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your loving kindness, Jesus. Father, if it wasn't for you, Lord God, I don't know where we would be. But Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful, Lord, that you're here already in this place with us. Father, as we just stay here, as we gather together, Lord, I pray, God, that you would minister to every single heart, every single mind in this place, every spirit, Jesus. I pray, Lord God, your presence would draw people from the outside. Lord God, I pray, Father, that we would just give you our all tonight, Lord Jesus. Father, have your way, Lord God. Lord, your will and your way is the right way, Jesus. I want to thank you and tell you that I love you, Lord, because you first loved me, Lord, because you first loved us. God, I want to thank you tonight once again for the cross. I want to thank you once again because you love me. I want to thank you once again for mercy extended. I want to thank you once again for the grace that you give, Jesus. Lord, in this place, God, I pray, Lord, as your word is spoken, as your worship is lifted up, Lord, that you would find it, find it, find it a sweet-smelling savor, God. Lord, I just want to hear your voice. I want to draw close to you. I want to walk with you, Jesus. And Lord, I want you to have your way, Father. To you be the honor and the glory, Lord. We're here for your purpose and nothing else. To you be the glory. In your mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. We're just going to give God the glory and worship him in spirit and in truth. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Jesus, fill us with your power. Lord, live inside of me. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power, Lord, live inside of me, oh, cause you're the living water, never trying fountain, comforter and counselor, take complete control, you are, you're the Never giant fountain, comforter and counselor, take complete control. Welcome, welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Oh, fill us with your power. Lord, live inside of me. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. Jesus, we are in your presence. Lord, fill us with your power. Oh, live inside of me. Oh, because you're the living water. You're the never drying fountain. You are the comforter and counselor. Lord, take complete control. You are. You're the living water. You're the never drying fountain. You are comforter and counselor. Take complete control. You are. You're the living water. Oh, never trying fountain. Comforter. Comforter and counselor. Oh, take complete control. Welcome. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. 
Jesus, we are in your presence. Oh, Father, fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Father, fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Oh, fill us with your power. Jesus, live inside of me. Fill us. Oh, fill us with your power. Lord, live inside of me. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Lord, we praise you. We magnify you, God. Lord, we lift you up as the almighty king. Glory to your name, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. Lord, we bless your holy name, almighty God. Glory to your holy name, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Lord. We lift you up, O God. Desiring to worship you, Jesus, in spirit and in truth, Lord. For you're the only living God. There's none beside you and there's none like you, God. Have your way in this place, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Oh, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Lord, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you oh but here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Oh, and To the earth you created and all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, Lord, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. Lord, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Oh, I'll never know how much it costs Oh, to see my sins upon that cross. Lord, I'll never know how much it costs. Oh, to see oh, my sin there upon that cross. 
No, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Lord, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Oh, Lord, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Lord, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Let's lift up Jesus because he's worthy. I love you, Lord. Father, we're here to worship you. We're here to seek after your heart, Lord, to seek your face, Jesus. Lord, I give you the glory and the honor. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We honor you tonight, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. God, let your will be done in this house. Father, not our will, Jesus, but your will be done. As the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, blessed be the name of Jesus. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah. Amen. So, if you have other things inhabiting your atmosphere, right? A bad day. Coworker got on your nerves. Cat ran out in front of your car and you had to hit it on the way here. Right? Whatever. I don't know. He inhabits the praises of his people. So sometimes instead of that looking at what's going on, you need to praise him. Praise is a weapon. Praise is an atmosphere changer. Praise will... Uh, give notice to the enemy who's in charge. Amen. Praise God. I am so thankful uh, just to be here. I'm so thankful you guys are here. You made it. The Bible study. Amen. So God bless you. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here. Amen. I am so excited. I get to introduce uh, Brother Anthony Miller here from Michigan, and uh, he is a, a fellow church planter. Uh, from Michigan, and we're just so excited. He's visiting this week, uh, doing some work out here in Philadelphia, and I'm so excited that you're here. Please come, just break the word, uh, do whatever's on your heart. Amen. Let's give that hand clap to the Lord. Can we just magnify him for just one more minute? Thank you, Lord. You are so good. You are so great and so mighty and so worthy of praise. It's through you we live and breathe. It's through you we gain our strength. It's through you that we are provided for. I thank you and I praise you. Come on, church. It might be a little awkward, but let's just push through one more second. Come on, come on. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Thank you, Lord, for how you've pulled me up out of that muck and yuck and set me upon a solid rock. I'm thankful that you're still a life-changing God. I'm still thankful that you are in the the soul-saving business still today. I give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. However, uh, Zach, he's my buddy. He didn't remember me, but I remembered him. Uh, could, could, would you help me out just one second? 
just passing some stuff out. Okay, cool. So everybody gets a few pages. Oops, except those two. I'll take those two. I give honor to your pastor and family tonight. It's an honor to be here again, especially uh, to be given the honor to stand behind a, a pulpit of a friend of mine and a fellow man of God. I, I give him I give him the honor that is due. The, the, the Bible says to give honor where honor is due, and I certainly honor your family tonight. And I've seen Zach up here praising him, Ian and Camille, helping mom and dad. I give you all uh, honor tonight. And he, he, he's coming. He's coming, I promise. And with the help of the Lord, we're going to unravel tonight some of the mysteries of God, who God is, who Jesus is, who the Spirit is, what speaking in tongues is all about, if you've heard of that, and uh, how that relates to our spiritual gifts. You know, tonight might be like drinking from a fire hose, but uh, I did teach this as a series with our church, and I've kind of packed in as much as I can. But I, I feel the Lord is here. I felt in prayer before the service and even during the worship that God's favor is upon this church and that God is not done doing a work here in this church. I, I, I'm going to speak prophetically for just a moment, if I could, that God has his hand upon this church. Revival is coming to this city. You will outgrow this church. You will outgrow this building. You will see revival. You will see souls saved in the name of Jesus. Souls baptized. Souls filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. What you've seen is not what is to come. What you have seen is not what is to come. What is to come is the best, is the harvest. And what you've done here, the work here to establish a work of God here does not go unnoticed by him. And he is pleased with this church. And I'm so grateful again to be in this place with you tonight. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate you. So let's begin with a basic understanding tonight. Pastor told me to teach. Is this all right? Yes. All right. So that God is a spirit. And I'm going to uh, use a lot of scripture tonight. I knew better than to give it to Pastor because he'll be flipping through about 100 of them. So that's why you have handouts tonight. I quickly did this before I left work. So you can go home and read it in your own Bible. Because I firmly believe that if any man gets behind a pulpit and preaches the Word of God or teaches the Word of God, you should be able to go home and pull up that scripture and read it for yourself, and it matches what the man of God said. Amen. So John 4.24 says this, God is a spirit. Notice here that John does not write that God is multiple spirits that God is any kind of spirit, like that we, just a normal kind of spirit, a regular kind of spirit. But God, uh, uh, John says God is a spirit, one spirit, and they that worship him, singular, not them, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalms 51.11 says, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your spirit from me. It doesn't say don't, don't, don't take the third person in a trinity spirit from me. Uh, careful, I'm not trying to cast shame on any other believers, uh, any kind of doctrines. I'm just giving you what the book says. The, uh, the writer of Psalms says, do not take your spirit away from me. And I feel like if there were different spirits, then John, or, or uh, the, the writer of the Psalm would say, particularly which spirit it is that he didn't want taken from him. Amen? Exodus 33, 20, uh, he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. We understand here that Scripture does not say, See us and live. Amen? It says, See me and live. And we understand here we're developing a thought that we're going to use uh, throughout the rest of this lesson that the Spirit of God, God is a spirit, and the Spirit did not have a body, okay, because God is a spirit. 
This is why in creation we see in Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God, not the spirits of God, not the body of God, hovered over the waters. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And let me just say before I go in, in any further, being behind this pulpit, I'm under the submission of your man of God. So if I say anything wacky, he's, he's going to fix me. You can just tell me to stop. God creates mankind. Mankind sins, turns away from God. Now there's a breach created by sin because God is perfect. It, it, God is sinless. God is holy. God cannot sin. God cannot be associated with sin God, in, in terms of that he can't take it on. There, God in sin, it's like, uh, what is that? Water and oil, right? They separate. They can't, we can't have that. I, and I do not have time to go through all this in detail, so we're going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, but there needed to be a sacrifice to take away the punishment of sin. There needed to be a So you see God is a spirit. He rested over the waters. The spirit of God rested over the waters. Fast forward a little bit. God creates mankind. Mankind sins. Okay? The introduction to sin in the world. You say, well, why, why did God allow mankind to sin? Well, God has, God has free will, right? We all believe that. God, God's not a robot. Nobody can tell God what to do, right? God has free will. And the Bible says that we're created in his image. If we were created in his image and he has free will, then we have to have free will. So God creates mankind in his image with free will. They use that free will. They do the wrong thing. They introduce sin into the world. And the Bible says from one man, meaning Adam, sin, it's inescapable. Sin is inescapable. We're all born into sin, so we can't qualify. And so fast forwarding a little bit, that's why you see God accepting the sacrifices of animals for a short time but notice that your book does not say to remove the sin. It pushes back the punishment of that sin. There needed to be a sacrifice because we're all born into sin. We're all born of sin. We do not qualify. We've got to understand that good works is not how we earn salvation. There needs to be a sacrifice Animal sacrifice was just a band-aid to push back the, treat, or the punishment of sin. There needed to be a holy and sinless sacrifice. Okay? You, you shouldn't pay debt off with debt. <laughs> right? You shouldn't, you, you know, I, I understand every circumstance is different, but you shouldn't take out a loan to pay off a loan that's paying off a loan, right? There, there, there needs to be at some point you use fresh money to pay off your loan, to, to make your books equal out. And this is the exact same situation we have here. Sin is introduced. Now there's a breach caused by the sin, and we can't use a sinful creature to pay the sin. Sin plus sin does not equal holiness. Okay, so number two, God the Spirit could not die on the cross. We understand this, that you can't nail jello to a wall, right? If the spirit does not have a body, which we've covered already, is that correct? Okay, so if the spirit does not have the body, the, the spirit could not be sacrificed. And, and, and spirits cannot be killed by man because spirits are eternal. They live on as receivers of judgment. You say, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're getting kind of creepy on me. I have scripture, Ecclesiastes 12 and 7 then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. We understand that we were formed by the dust or dirt of the ground, and to that we will turn back into our flesh. But our spirit, it belongs to God, and it will return to God. Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, Say that at 10 o'clock at night when it's dark outside and you hear a stick break and you don't know who broke it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we're all working on our faith here, okay? Or maybe it's just me. Uh, do not fear those who kill the body or a grasshopper, uh, but cannot kill the soul, okay? Do not fear those who... People can kill the body, 
but they cannot kill the soul. Revelation 6 and 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. In other words, spirits cannot die. So this was the plan of God. And I understand to some of you this might be a foundational lesson you've heard 15 times, but I pray that this is what the Lord gave me, and I, and I pray that, that this may be the foundation that you need tonight. Amen. Number three, this was the plan of God. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. The, the God hatched this whole plan from the beginning. Mankind introduced sin into the world, yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It was God's original plan to save humanity. But, he, but you got to understand here that, that the, God as a spirit could not do it. You and I couldn't do it. Animals could not do it. And, and God knew all along what he was going to do. Let's look at the definition of manifest. I did include this in your notes because, again, I want you to go look at this and tell me if I'm, if I'm fibbing or not. You can open your dictionary and see that one of the, the definitions of manifest is to show or demonstrate plainly. To reveal. <laughs> to reveal. This is why Scripture says Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the Spirit God, the firstborn of all creation. That's Colossians 1 and 15. Scripture does not ever say that Jesus is separate from God. Jesus is the image of God. In other words, God put his spirit into a body so that we could see him and so that his body could be stricken and sacrificed for our redemption. Oh, my God. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I, I closed my eyes, and in my mind's eye, I saw myself inflicting pain upon the God of all creation. And it struck me in that moment right there in that seat that God himself would take on a body and die for me. 1 Timothy 1.17, now to the one, now to the one king. Does scripture say now to the king's? No, Scripture does not say, look it up in your Bible, that to the one king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, uh, Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And you might say, hold up, preacher. Jesus just said uh, he got all his stuff from his daddy. Mm-hmm. All the bills paid from, the, from daddy, all the cheeseburgers from daddy, and all the powers from daddy. And you might say, hold up, preacher, you're saying my, my father, you've already introduced a scripture here that's contradicting your, yourself. Well, hold on, let's understand here. The language of father and son in your Bible does not instruct that we're dealing with two different people. We've got to understand, we've got to take tradition away just because we've heard it that way doesn't necessarily mean it's true. I was dealing with a uh, situation yesterday when a woman messaged the church and was uh, using one scripture to, to say her point, and it was completely out of context. And I took the time to patiently reply, and 12 paragraphs later, I pray to God she has the full context of the verse that she shared. We have to look at the Bible as a whole, and we have to understand that there are certain ways of speaking and that we're going to cover. We've already laid the foundation, uh, church, that God is the God. God is the only God. He is the one king and that he is a spirit. Are you still with me? Other verses in, the, in your Bible do not contradict this. To say and understand that Jesus is the son of God is still appropriate. You say, how, how can this be, preacher? Well, here are the definitions of son. One's male child, a male descendant. Uh, a man considered as if in a relationship of child and parent. One personified or regarded as a male descendant. 
Well, there we already go. Well, one regarded as a male descendant. One used as a familiar form of address for a young man. Hey, how you doing, son? You don't hear that too much very often, but there are still elders that will call young men their sons even when they're not. Uh, the last definition here is a person closely associated with or deriving from a formative agent such as a nation, school, or race. A person closely associated with or deriving from. I'm not trying to stretch scripture here. I want you to take this note sheet home and you can look it up and pray about it. Let God open your eyes to what's happening here. Whatever gives shape to something else may be called formative. For example, we could say that the Grand Canyon is the product of the formative power of water. You can say that land is carved out by the formative power of water. If water starts flowing, the land is going to start being affected. Amen? Amen. Okay, so water can create things because it has formative power. In other words, Jesus is a formative product of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God formed Jesus in Mary's womb. Where's scripture for that, preacher? Well, Luke 135, the Holy Spirit. Well, if we've already understood that God is a spirit, God is the only spirit, there's only one God, there's only one spirit, he's the one king, he's the one everything up until this point, we see, see the introduction of the Holy Spirit, and who can we deduce that is? The Holy Spirit. Who is the only Holy Spirit? Spirit. It is God. So we can say when we, when we read the Holy Spirit will come upon you in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, you can replace that with God will come upon you. So uh, in the power of the Most High, which is also God, right, will overshadow you for that, can I insert formative reason. And also the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So Mary gets this word that God will come upon her, and the, his power will overshadow. Does that sound familiar? Genesis 1 and 2, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Could it be that God was speaking all the way back to creation? Praise God, I feel his presence right here. Could it be that, that, that this scripture is referencing Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? How the Spirit of God hovered over the waters? The Spirit of God hovered over Mary, and he shall be called the Son of God. Matthew one twenty three. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. God with us. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet, folks, and, and he wrote this for... Unto us a child is born. To us uh, a son is given. A son. That's okay. So hang with me. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mighty God. Wait a minute. Unto us a son is given. And he shall be called the Mighty God. Woo! I love this scripture because Isaiah is laying it out. He's saying that Jesus is going to be born. He's going to be a son. Duh, because he has a mommy, he's a baby. He's going to need changed and nursed and fed. and He's going to cry and you're going to get annoyed and he's going to be a son. But you're going to call him mighty God. Well, that's real exciting until you continue reading the scripture that is in your Bible that says that Jesus is going to be born and he, he's going to be called Everlasting Father. Now, wait just a minute here. Our, I'm already getting excited, and we haven't even gotten to this. Scripture says a son will be born, and he shall be called the Father. Now, I don't know about Ian. I don't know about Zach. But I don't know that, that, that your family goes around calling you pops. <laughs> exactly. Does anybody call you dad? Anybody go to you for paying the bills? Okay, well, then you're not dad. My son, Michael, he's 11, going on 76, and so he likes to parent his younger brothers, and he likes to be a mini dad, but I have to tell him all the time, son, I love you, but 
I'm their father. I have never heard in our culture a son being called the father because it's just not true. Sons are not fathers, yet we see in Scripture, is this okay? All right, all right, that Jesus, the Son of God, will be called the everlasting Father. Now, either our God is one all the way around, or Scripture contradicts itself. Now, I've never heard of Scripture contradicting itself. In Jesus shall be called the Prince of Peace. The Old Testament prophet states it so clearly. There will be a son given who will be called the Everlasting Father, who will be called the Wonderful Counselor. Well, later we're going to, I'm watching the time. Yes, I am. Later we're going to talk about the Wonderful Counselor that's going to be sent, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. So the two, two different terms, I don't really care which one you use. If your pastor cares, do what he says. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, the wonderful counselor, you shall call him Jesus, the counselor, the wonderful counselor, the one that will be sent to you. His name is Jesus, and then you're going to call him the everlasting father. Who is the father? God. You shall call him God. You shall call him the Holy Ghost. You shall call him Jesus. They're not different names. They're not in the terms that they're different people. They're not. This is you, People have read the book, and they've inserted their own opinion. I'm sorry. I'm just giving you what the Scripture says. Is this all right, Pastor? Okay. Praise God. The Son will be called the Father. The Son will be called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Number five. Jesus speaks of his bodily death and the coming of the Spirit. You understand here that I'm fast-forwarding just a little bit. If you watch The Chosen, if the pastor says it's okay, it's a wonderful show, showing Jesus' life, his disciples. This is wonderful because I've been able to to put a little picture with with Jesus' face, a little picture with the disciples, get to know their personalities. And I know it's just a TV show. But it's really been a great visual for me. And we see Jesus speaking of his bodily death in Scripture. When Jesus starts his ministry, it's almost immediately, he can't even help himself to start talking in riddles. But they're not riddles, they're called parables. And he uses parables and he's saying these wacky wild things to, 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 to try to illustrate, to try to paint a picture that he's going to die. But that's not the end of the story. John 16, 7 through 14. This is a long one, but it matters. Jesus is talking here. He says this, Nevertheless, or really, guys, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, and not to Pizza Hut. For if I do not go away, the counselor, wait a minute, do you, re- do you recognize that term? The counselor. <laughs> the spirit, my spirit the counselor, will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send the Spirit to you. How how can Jesus send the Spirit? How can Jesus say that he's going to send the Spirit if he wasn't God? Nobody has the power to do that except God himself. Even the Pharisees understood what Jesus was. Nobody can say this that's not God. And Jesus, toward the end, he started getting kind of salty with them, and he's saying, look, you, you looking at him. Have you not seen? When my Holy Spirit comes, my Holy Spirit, will. this is back in Scripture, will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I'm going to my Father. Preacher, what you doing? I almost said pastor. I'm feeling, I'm feeling at home, y'all. I'm not... <laughs> preacher, I'm going to my Father, my Spirit lives on in heaven, and you will see me no more, though my body dies, and of judgment, because the ruler of this world stands condemned. Verse 12, I have yet many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 confirms, great is the mystery of godliness. But when my Holy Spirit of truth comes, he or I will guide you into all truth. For, and when you see the brackets in your notes, I'm, I'm replacing the word 
And you can please take the note home, compare it with Scripture. I'm replacing the word because we've already built an understanding. For my Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority. The Spirit is not separate from me. Okay? For the Spirit will not speak on his own authority. Every one of you has some kind of authority, even if it's over your own, your own life. That's all the authority that you have right now. You don't have to be a manager at your place of employment. You don't have to be the principal of your school. You don't have to, you don't have, to ha- have somebody give you authority. You have autonomy over self. You have at least some authority. And yet Scripture says here, Jesus says, uh, the, the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority. Well, everybody else does. We can only come to one conclusion here, that the Spirit is not separate from Him. But He will speak whatever He hears me say, (laughs) and He will tell you things that are to come, and how can the Spirit that has no authority do that? Because it's the Spirit of God, because God is all-knowing. Verse 14, he will glorify me because there's only one deserving of glory. There's only one deserving of honor, and that is Jesus Christ. He will receive from me as we are one and will declare it to you. He will receive from me, and he's going to tell you. We're not talking about three different people. We're we're talking about language here just to let you know that, that something's coming but it's all the same spirit because Jesus is in control. Number six, the birth of the New Testament church. Uh, Now let's cover this. Number six, that's down underneath here. Uh, When the day of Pentecost arrived, this is Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 1, we see that his spirit is going to enter the people after Jesus' death. Remember how Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go, because if I go, the, com- the counselor comes to you, the comforter comes to you, and, and Isaiah prophesied that, that you're going to call him Jesus, who's the counselor, who's the comforter. You understand this. So now Jesus is, 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 is left. Uh, here we are in the timeline. We fast-forwarded a little bit in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost is finally coming. And they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven... Where else would it come from? A sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested upon each one of them. And they were all, Scripture says. They don't say somebody went home without it. It says they were all filled with the one Holy Spirit. I inserted one because we've already identified that the Spirit is one Spirit. Amen? See, so I, I can plug that. I'm not adding to Scripture. you got to understand this. I'm not adding to Scripture. Scripture talks about that. I ain't doing that. I'm just adding understanding because we already know that when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about number two. We're not talking about number three. We're not talking about person number six. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. In my church, you know what kind of kick I've been on? Not calling it the Spirit but calling it his spirit. Oh, I feel the spirit here. No, I don't. I feel his spirit here. I want to identify it as his because it is his. Every good thing comes from above. And began to speak in other tongues as the spirit or as his spirit or as God gave them the utterance. It's so cool to put your understanding into scripture. As your pastor teaches you, take some notes. Take it home, and when he says this scripture is for you, replace who he's, what scripture is talking about with your name. Finally, Anthony, whatsoever things are true and just and pure, if there be any glory, if there be any, any honor, think, think on these things. You can do that with scripture. You're not changing scripture. You're not adding words to scripture. You're just putting, it, putting your understanding on it. That's all right to do with things like this. You, you, you can understand. You, you, you can put in here. Anthony will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You, you can do that with Scripture. Read it out and see how it will change your life. 
Some saw this uh, happen, and they were amazed, and others, they mocked them. And Peter comes out and addresses the crowd, explaining that the disciples are not drunk as they supposed. It, it, it was early in the day. And he refers to the prophet Joel in 2.28, saying that God had poured out his spirit on all the people, allowing them to prophesy. You've got to understand that the Old Testament is connected to the New Testament. And, and the funny bone is connected to the other funny bone, because when one gets hit, the other doesn't feel good. Or is that just me? I don't know. Are you all still with me today? Okay. All right. I get a little crazy sometimes. All right. He continues his sermon, Peter does, by speaking about uh, Jesus of Nazareth and his miracles, his crucifixion, his resurrection. What is this, folks? The gospel. Yes! He starts preaching the gospel, the good news that Jesus, who was God, <laughs> was manifest in the flesh, took the punishment for their sins, died and rose again, and now he has come back to live in us. The crowd was deeply moved by Peter's sermon and asked what they should do. Peter instructs them to repent to be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, which is the complete cleansing of sins. Your sins are gone. Your sins are wiped away. God remembers them no longer. You have a clean slate, says the Lord. When you go under the water with him in death and in burial and come up with him in resurrection, you are a new creature in Christ. You have a new uh, aura about you. You have a new life. You have a new start. Oh, my God. I, I, ah, I'm just so excited. It was 2009 in Flint, Michigan. If you heard about the water, I, I was there about that time. And uh, I started going to church because I wanted to, to get with my, my now wife. And I thought it was, would be a great idea if I attended her church, you know. And maybe that earned me some brownie points. I'm just being honest, okay? If I were to write a book like this, I, it, it would be in the book. I'd be in the book. I, I wasn't in church, okay? And so I started going to church for her. Well, all of a sudden, I started feeling the presence of God. And on Father's Day, June of 2009, I had issues with my knees, and I could barely stand up, sit down, lay down without pain. I was called patellofemoral pain syndrome. And the doctors couldn't do anything. They said, basically, you just got to take Tylenol ibuprofen until you die. And I said, well, that's not a very good outlook. They said, well, what do you want us to do? And they were singing this song in this apostolic church just like this one. And, and all of a sudden, I felt to stand up through the pain, and I started worshiping the Lord. And Danielle's grandfather came over to me, laid his hand on my forehead, started praying for me that I would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Sure enough, before I knew it, I was speaking in tongues, had no idea what was happening to me. He said, you've received the Spirit of God. The next step is to be baptized in water in his name. What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Whose church is this? Jesus. It don't matter how many people are here if Jesus is here. Amen. Woo. And so I went up the stairs to the baptismal area, got my robe on, and everything went down in the water. It was buried in his name, and the only saving name given among men whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. And I came up out of the water, got myself dried off, checked in the mirror, make sure my hair looked all right, went back down the stairs. They were still singing, and I was doing this and praising God, and all of a sudden, I literally, I realized what I was doing. I was jumping, and I went like this. God. My knees had been healed and completely restored, and I haven't had a knee problem since because it was Jesus who filled me with his spirit, and it was Jesus. Oh, my God, I feel his spirit in this place tonight. 
I was buried in the name of my God, Jesus Christ, and he affected me. He saved me. He changed my life, and I have never been the same physically, spiritually, emotionally. I have never been the same. And the same God is here today in this place. The same God who did it for me in 09 can do it for you in 24. It doesn't matter how many people are here. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter who you are. All that matters is that you open your heart to him and surrender and say, I'm leaving my sinful life behind. I'm ready for a fresh start. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, I want to be baptized in your name. If you're watching on the live stream, you call your pastor and set up a time to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. And they will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And how did they know they received God's Spirit? Well, just a couple verses back up. And, and they all were all filled with the one Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. What are you saying, preacher? I've come to tell you this, that you understand you have the Spirit of God in you if you have the evidence. What's the evidence? They were all filled and they began to speak in other tongues as His Spirit gave them the utterance. That's your sign. That's your sign. And I'm sorry to tell you, if, if you haven't spoken in tongues yet, you still don't have a spirit yet. But I'm here to tell you that if you want it, you can have it. Tonight. Because Peter ends his sermon by saying, this, prom, this, prom, this is a promise, what you have seen and what you have heard. Ver, two, Acts 2.39, this is a promise. The promise is for you and your children, and your children's children, and your children's 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 children's, and as many as the Lord our God shall call, even into 2024 in September at Bristol Worship Center, this is still a promise in your book, because the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, come on, your book is alive. Your book is alive, and your book is the truth. So these, these people, they, they asked, what shall we do? Because they desired salvation. They had just witnessed this great miracle, and they had heard the people, and then they had just been preached to, and they had heard the gospel being preached and delivered by such a powerful man of God who some of them knew who had a history. It was complicated. Peter's history was complicated. You... you, you some, some of y'all, you'd be using that in relationships. Uh, are y'all all together? Oh, it's complicated. Uh-huh. Facebook has a status for that. It's, it's com <laughs> in complicated with Danielle Miller. Thank, praise God. No, I'm not. But you, but you understand here what I'm trying to say. Uh, Peter had a complicated past. Peter had a past that... that uh, he, he didn't understand why Jesus was using him. He didn't understand that, they, that why Jesus would love him because of the things that he had done, because of the type of person that he was. Uh, that, that resonates with me because before I found Jesus, before Jesus found me, however you want to say it, I was a wretch, wretched man, wretched man. The night before I started, the night before I came to the Apostolic Church for the very first time and felt the presence of God because His Spirit was in the place, I was at a certain type of club. Okay, some of y'all might know what I'm talking about. And I crashed on my friend's couch, still in the same clothes as I was wearing in the club. Still smelled like it. And I woke up the next morning, trying to you know get with my wife, and and I said, Hey, what church do you go to again? Because I had one thing on my mind. And sure enough, I pulled up to that church wearing the same clothes as I had just clothed, And yet God still showed me what his presence felt like in that house. No, I wasn't filled the first day. No, I wasn't filled the first month. I had to build a relationship with him. I had to struggle with my own demons that lived inside me that said, you're not worthy. This isn't for you. And I had to fight back against him. But at the end of the day, God had a plan for me. And God has a plan for you. And it's to fill you with his spirit. It's to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. And it's for you to have a relationship with him. And it's to, have, it's to lead you to other people 
people that can have the same experience and to build a relationship with him. Our God is alive and our God is loving and our God is peaceful and joyful and he cares deeply about you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just take a moment. Just lift your hands, clap your hands, just whatever you feel comfortable with. Let's just give him glory in the place right now. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you. I'm not ending. I'm not ending. I'm not done. Let's just give him glory for just a minute. Thank you. I love you so much, Lord. I love you so much, Lord. Oh, my God. 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 You are great. You are mighty, Lord, and worthy to be praised. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, my God, my God. Acts, Galatians, Romans, Ephesians, they all outline the same salvation experience, folks. Read your book in the same, the same one listed in Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name, the one name. Notice that Jesus, in your book, look it up, does not say in the names. you got to understand this. Jesus does not say in the names. Jesus says, therefore, to his disciples he's speaking, go therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father. Tonight we have covered who the name of the Father is. Who is it? Jesus because Isaiah prophesied it before Jesus even walked on this earth. You shall call him Jesus, the Father. So we understand that Jesus is saying you should baptize them in the name of the Father to his disciples. He's, you got to understand context. These disciples have been traveling with him this whole time. They knew the Father. They knew that the Father was Jesus. So, you, so Jesus is saying go and baptize them. I mean, what, 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 what you know? In the name of the Son. Well, who does your book say the Son is? Jesus. Okay, that's an easy one, but you all get an A+. Plus. And, and uh, remember, he's the formation of the Spirit. And who is the Spirit? Jesus. The Counselor. The Comforter is Jesus. He's been, he's been teaching these people, these disciples, all this time, all this stuff, telling them who God is, telling them who he is. And now he's saying, now go baptize them, and they shall be filled with my spirit. What is the great commission? Go and baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Not, do not baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because those are titles. When I get a check from work, it don't say the husband of Danielle. I can't take that to the bank and cash it. You got to understand the Bible as a whole. You got to read the whole of your Bible. Not H-O-L-E, W-H-O-L-E. You got to get it, all of it. And you understand that everybody after the day of Pentecost, once his spirit was poured out, and they went and they, they started preaching to people all through Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, you, don't, you can't find one time somebody was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry if that's the way you were brought up. I'm sorry if God, I'm, well, I'm not sorry if God's doing something on your heart right now. But you understand, I'm trying to teach you something. Your book does not say anyone was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Your book, look it up. Your book says that Cornelius and his entire house spoke in other tongues and was baptized in the name of Jesus. The 12 disciples of John the Baptist spoke in tongues. Acts 19, 1, 5. Paul said self-edification takes place when a believer speaks in tongues. Paul said for one who speaks in tongues, speak in, 
For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Jesus said that speaking in tongues would be a sign that would follow the believer. Let me just pause right here. I know I'm watching the clock. I gotta, I gotta close this thing up. Accepting the Lord as your personal Savior, we, we, we have understood that. That's conception. That is conception. That's why they call it the new birth. When you're baptized and you, re, you receive his spirit. That's your new birth. Belief is the conception. And all throughout your Bible, it says that everybody who was baptized was baptized one way and one way only. That was in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And everybody that was baptized was filled with his spirit. Pastor, I'm not going to finish my lesson, but praise God. That's okay. Let me find a good place to stop. So let's cover tongues and then we'll be done and and uh, you, you, you got the notes. You can read them and look up Scripture for the rest of it. They call this uh, experience a new birth. And, and God uses tongues because that's what he picked. But we have to understand here that when a new baby is born, they have their own language. <laughs> oh, again, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Even though she experiences pain before the baby comes, typically it's after her water breaks that she needs to go to the hospital, hospital because it's time for the baby to come out. The baby is surrounded in amniotic fluid or water for nine months. For the baby to be born, it must come out of the water. Now, when the baby emerges out of the water, that baby is still not fully born. The baby's fully born when it's disconnected from its former environment. Someone suctions the nose and the mouth and cuts the umbilical cord, and usually the baby will cry, but... If they're like one of my kids, they didn't, and they got to tickle them or something to make them cry and, and, and because they want to make sure that the baby is breathing on their own. Note, note the stages of this birth process. The baby comes out of the water. The baby takes a breath from its new environment, and the baby cries. That's what takes place in the natural birth, and it's the same thing Jesus is describing in, the, in, in, in Scripture in the new birth. When you're baptized, you come out of the water, leaving your old life behind. Like an umbilical cord, your ties to your sinful life are symbolically cut. Then you must take your first breath in your new life, and it comes with a sound, a cry. This is what happens when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You're going to be speaking in a language that you don't understand, a new language because you're born again. As a baby comes out of the water and the warmth of his mother into a new environment, he must make a sound because crying forces them to breathe on their own. So it is when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're entering a new living environment and there must be a sound. It's not a language that comes from your head and it's not a language you learned. And you, as you give yourself to worship and prayer, you're going to speak a new language. That is how you know. You're filled with his Holy Spirit, the literal Spirit of God. Would you stand with me tonight? I got to be done. I don't want to go over what Pastor said. Would you stand with me all over the place? I don't know if this is typical for you, but I feel it. Pastor, is this okay? Let, let, I, I, you know what? It does not matter who you are. It does not matter who, where, where you come from or what you come from. God has a plan for your life.